All right, all set. The chair notes the time is 6.04. I call this meeting of the Amersonian Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with a roll call of ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Craig Meadows, not present. Mr. Everell Henry. Here. Mr. Philip White. I know he's here. Um, Ms. Hilda Greenbaum. Here. Quorum is present. Also attending the public hearing tonight is uh, Christine Brestrup, planning director for the town, and Mr. Rob Wachilla, planner for the town, and Carolyn Murray, who acts as counsel for the board. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 48 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 48 and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff and may be viewed via the town of Amherst's YouTube channel and its CBA web, web page. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the hearing, after which the board will hear questions for clarif will have questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. The public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen or by pressing star nine on their phone. The chair, with the assistance of the staff, will call upon people wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address to the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about the project and input from the public is gathered, followed by a public meeting for each. The public meeting of the portion is when the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the application tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merit, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Tonight's agenda, a public hearing on CBA FY 2024-03, Valley Community Development Corporation request for a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40B to construct 30 owner-occupied affordable residential units located on 15, in 15 duplex structures, parking areas with 58 spaces, common areas, and other site improvements on a 9.047 acre site with requested waivers from zoning bylaws, general bylaws, subdivision regulations, sewer water connections uh, approvals at 2040 Ball Lane, Map 5A, Parcel 56, RN, Neighborhood Residence, and RLD, low residential low density residential zoning districts and fc farmland conservation overlay zoning district this hearing is continued from december 21st 2023 tonight's topics include the following uh, requested waivers consideration of requested waivers and consideration of conditions of the POS of the comprehensive permit in addition i understand the applicant has a request to review and approve and that for the board to review and approve site plan of buildings, structures, and impermeable surfaces in advance of the consideration of this application by the CONCOM Commission. Following the uh, tonight's hearing uh, on this matter, this is a general public comment period on matters before, not before the board tonight, and other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. So the first order of business is to continue consideration of ZBA 2024-03, Valley Community Development Corporation request for a comprehensive permit under Massachusetts General Law Chapters 40B. Are there any disclosures by members of the board? If not, uh, let's go through su new submissions since our last meeting. And Rob, I think there are four. Um, if there's additional, please let me know. One is a revised list of waiver requests 
dated 1 for 2024. Uh, that has, shows red line changes from an earlier um, waiver request list that the applicant had submis submitted. Two, Amherst Community Homes memo on owner selection and local preferences, dated 1 for 2024. Assessor comments, the town assessor comments, dated 12 27 23, and a draft decision document uh, dated 12 27 23. Is there anything else, Rob? Yes, yeah, so you also have a comment that was submitted from Janet McGowan on December 21st, 2023. Um, that was submitted too close to the last hearing, and that's why it's being included in this meeting packet for this evening. Um, and just double checking my email. Uh, you seem to hit uh, pretty much all the submissions, Steve. I got them. Yeah. All right. So what I'd like to do tonight in terms of process is um, I, I think the first thing we can get go through is the request of the applicant to consider for us to give a in effect a blessing or approve the site plan for the buildings the impermissible I mean, the impermeable um, land surfaces other structures so that they can then go to the concom commission to get approval and that's supposed to happen i think in a couple of weeks so you have a meeting with the concom and the reason for that is if if it's approved they can then start the the uh, they, they can do their um, the work that requires some money and some testing if it's not approved, they may have to go back and do it over again. When Rob brought this up to me, it seemed to me that it made sense because there hasn't been a lot of discussion about changes to the buildings, the footprint, to the um, impermeable surfaces that we have on the on the plan. Um, but this is the time if there are things that you wish to change or things that we're concerned about, we should bring them up. But ideally, what this would do is allow them to then go to the CONCOM. So that's my understanding of what your request is. Ms. Allen, maybe you want to be um, speak to it yourself. And then what I'd like to do is have a motion that we, in principle, um, approve the site plan and the impermeable areas. Um, I, I don't imagine we're going to change that, but I think that would be a, a proper approach and gives them freedom and to move ahead and saves them a little bit of money, the possibility of additional expenditures. Go ahead, Ms. Gal Allen. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. I think you've um, summarized that pretty well. So as you know, we're on a parallel um, permitting track with Conservation Commission. Um, one of the things that the CONCOM is looking at is stormwater. Um, anytime we're changing any impervious um, expanding footprints, that's going to change the stormwater calculations. And so um, doing all of that work again and again can get costly for nonprofit developers to continue to do revisions. And so what we're asking is for the board to give some preliminary um, approvals for a couple of the site plan items that we discussed previously. Um, I think most of them were addressed in a submission that I provided to the board on uh, December 7th. So um, there were some architectural plan revisions that were provided in advance of that date. Um, and we also had a response to the planning board comments, which which talked about some of these things as well. So I think there's like really three things um, that are key to us to move forward with our um, conservation commission permit. One is the mailbox area. So there was a, um, a discussion and a request about either consolidating that mailbox area into one gathering space or changing it in such a way that it becomes a community gathering space since there isn't a community house as part of this development project. Um, and so what we, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm recovering from COVID myself. So just to give you a heads up on that. Um, so uh, what we decided to do, and I'm happy to share my screen if that would be helpful to to show those plans, if that would be helpful. Yes. Be okay. Good. Yes. Okay. Um, let's see. So here, can you see the shed? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, so what we did is we're keeping the footprint essentially the same in terms of the this footprint piece, but what we're doing is we're gonna be um, covering the entire space. The first iteration just had this section covered and then this side was open. Now we're covering the entire entire space we're adding a bench, we have more spaces for carts and we have a mailbox in one location. So this is the pedestals that would go into the ground. This would be flat with the ground. 
Um, but this is essentially what it would look like. And the other piece to this is that we are proposing to sort of um, flip flop this a little bit so that the opening to the mailbox area is closer to the pedestrian way. So that is one um, one thing that we have um, we're proposing. We did look at trying to do one mailbox area. Um, we, we just don't believe that it's really feasible. And the other part of it is if we placed it at one parking lot versus the other, if somebody is parking at one side and then they have to walk all the way to the other side to get their mailbox um, and to get their mail to go back to their building, it just didn't seem efficient. There wasn't really a good central location for it. So we're still proposing to keep two, but we're expanding those two mailbox areas to at least be more of a gathering space in each of those locations. Any questions regarding the mailbox or the mail um, shed? Rob? So it's not really a question, but more of a suggestion. Um, I guess if they're you know, going to stick to the two separate mailboxes, I recommend to the board that you propose a condition where they have either clearly marked signage for postal carriers or have some sort of way of distinguishing the different units that use each mailbox just so you can save some confusion down the road. I'm going to take note of that myself. I know Carolyn's writing down some notes, so we're going to definitely incorporate that, but that's that's a recommendation I just want to make to the board. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Um, Ms. Greenbaum. Um, Hilda, you're, you're muted. I'm just, my question probably doesn't make any difference. Were they on a hard surface before so that actually there's less place or cost more place for the rain to go? I don't know how to say that. The footprint is exactly the same. So the 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 slab piece hasn't changed at all. It's just that we've covered it so that it it creates um more of a shelter for people to be able to go in and get their mail. So it's I more guess my, my question wasn't clear, I guess. No, was it on a hard surface before or was it on a grassy area raised? It was always on a on a slab, concrete slab. Always always on the slab. Okay. So that makes no difference. All right. What's the next? The next um has to do oh. with um the storage area. So there was mm -hmm. a request to expand these um exterior storage areas. Is everybody seeing this on the plan? Okay. Yeah. Um, so this is actually doubled in size. So it, it was half the size and now it's double what it was before. Um, so that's the second amendment. And that does have some impacts to the stormwater calculations. Minor as it is, it is more impervious mm -hmm. surface that we're adding to the project. And so that needs us um, that then we'd have to rerun the calculations for the stormwater. Any questions about the storage space? Hilda, Ms. Greenbaum, do you have a question? Sorry, I turned the mute on, so no, I have no questions. All righty. Okay, I think that makes sense. That's, it does makes it a more functional space. And uh, all right, Ms. Allen, what's the third one? I, I think Rob has a question. Oh, Rob, there Just you go. Like just clarifying question. So does this apply to all units, Jessica, or is this mm -hmm. only for a certain few? Okay. Nope. Thanks. For all of the units. Yep. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. Sure. Um, and then the last piece was that there was a lot of discussion about um, community facilities. And so what we're proposing is that this area here um, you know, it's going to be based on the stormwater house, but this area might get expanded a little bit bigger, but instead of being labeled as a future community garden, it's going to be labeled as future community facilities. And this would allow um, the tenants, or I mean, the, um, the homeowners, if they decide in the future that they want to build a fire pit, if they want to build a pavilion, if they want to build a community house, that they have the ability to do that. So this, um, this, square footage of this area is important in the stormwater calculations because we need to make sure that if there's a structure that's actually built there, the site can accommodate it. My understanding from the civil team is that we do have some room in our stormwater calculations, but we don't have a whole heck of a lot. So we need to we need to um, look at this in terms of square footage to make sure that it, it's um, viable. But that is our plan right now. Okay. 
the other thing that that um, we did talk about is snow storage, and mm -hmm. I know that could have an effect on the stormwater. Do you have a? And, and I know you modified your storms, your snow storage plants. Can you go through those with us? Do you have those? Um, I may need to have Josh Klein, if he's on the call, jump on and discuss that because I don't have that information off the top of my head. I can, um, Mr. I Chair, think I can go We talked about ahead it during the stormwater discussion. Yep, we did. And I don't think it's changed at all since that stormwater discussion. But it's changed since the original, changed from the original proposal, correct? Correct. He, he may yeah. need to jump on and. Um, yeah, maybe Josh could just get on and give us, Mr. Klein could get, yeah. get on and give us a quick rundown of that, because that also has a stormwater implication. Right, he should be, um, he should have microphone capabilities right now. Mr. Klein, give us your name and address for the record. Josh Klein, 120 Washington Street, Salem, Mass. I don't, I don't have the ability to share share screen or video. Um, I don't know if you want me just to verbally kind of walk the board. Yep. Can you through? verbally walk walk the board through this? Yep. So the we did present kind of a we basically took the original site plan and kind of highlighted in color some of the snow storage impacts. We're talking about very minimal changes to what was originally proposed. We kind of introduced an additional area. Um, along one of the driveways, we kind of moved around a couple areas slightly at the end of the parking areas. There wasn't, you know, major modifications. One of the nice advantages of this site is there's plenty of room for snow storage. It's not like we have a situation where we have a tight parking lot surrounded by a fence with a building right there and we have nowhere to put the snow. Uh, yeah. There's a lot of room, um, you know, for us to kind of be able to safely move and navigate snow on site. I remember that we pushed them off to the side and it freed up those parking spaces, if I'm correct. Is that there are some parking spaces that were dedicated in the winter to snow storage and those are now opened up and, and are not, envi not envisioned that those would be used for snow storage. Is that correct? There's There was some temporary parking spaces where we're going to be pushing snow behind them. So yeah. what's nice about that is you know no one would be parked in those um, in a long-term scenario. So it, those are, those kind of spaces are always free, essentially. So, you know, or they're only supposed to be used in short term. So that would be, they're a great place for us to be able to push snow. Great. Thank you. And Ms. Allen, I forgot to ask you to be, to introduce yourself and give us your address for the record. Oh, but you have to do that with your mic on. <laughs> Jessica <laughs> Allen, um, real estate project manager at Valley Community Development. Great. And Ms. Murray, Attorney Murray, you have your hand up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just um, <laughs> had one question um, with respect to the community garden area being designated as a future, you know, community facilities. I think I heard Jessica say it could even potentially be developed for some sort of a building of some sort if the if the future homeowners decide they want to do that and that we do have some limited square footage in the stormwater calcs that we could work with. Um, I know that um, when Christine and, and Rob and I were working through, um, you know, the preliminary draft decision, one of the things we were trying to think about was anticipating a modification such as this, you know, some future community building um, or community playground or whatever it is they decide without burdening the homeowners with having to come back before the board to modify the comprehensive permit. So I just want to flag that for the board as we start thinking about these things that, you know, for example, if, um, if there is a maximum square footage right now that we know of um, on, that won't affect the stormwater calculations, perhaps the board would like to incorporate that maximum square footage into some sort of condition so yeah. that up to that amount, um, you know, some kind of structure uh, could be constructed here without having to modify the permit. Just something to bear in mind, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I think that's a really good suggestion to have as a um, option for a condition. Yeah, thank you. Okay, uh, Ms. Greenbaum. 
Um, I would like to pose my same question again, that since these yards do not have driveways where little children can, well, very little children can ride their little bikes, baby carriages, whatever, um, would this calculation include a, a small paved over area for, for tot activities? So the parents don't have to go all the way to Mill River for a few minute little ride with their kids or you know that kind of thing. Because I don't think it's a good idea to teach a one and a half, two year old kid that it's okay to play in the road. So can we write this or, or is there enough um, um, impervious area left so that the homeowners can put a small um, tired over area for small children and their in quotes vehicles. And I say this because there's no driver. My kids all learn to ride their bikes in the driveway, but the, you know, you don't have one there. Well, we do have the pedestrian way, which is, um, you know, 12 feet of impervious surface wide. So that is a pretty substantial, almost like a driveway that's running through the middle of the of the well, um, of the development. But that being said, in the response to that we had, we did say tot lot. We said playground slash tot lot. So we can consider that in terms of our impervious calculations. Um, I would turn to Josh to to verify how they um, you know talk about how they would do that. But I'm sure they could run calcs in a number of different facilities that potentially could be there. Yeah, well, I'm thinking, I know you have a driveway with only emergency vehicles going through, but it's it's still, I think, a wrong message to teach a child, but it's okay that you can take your your little vehicle, baby carriage, into the road to play. So I, I just want to make sure that that's covered somewhere, that the words are put in whatever condition we make so i mean the condition can be that it's up to the homeowners up to the homeowners association to decide which they want to do there's x amount of feet within which a uh, square footage within which you can put impervious services one of those could be a building that surface could be a tot lot that surface could be something else so right now there's it's the question is i guess right now the condition would state something to the effect that there is um up to X amount of square footage that could be additional impervious surface, the homeowners association can choose to do what they wish, wish with that. It's how well, it's, that's what, that's how I see it. But you would want to say specifically, there has to be a, um, a tot lot of some sort. Well, I would like to make a suggestion. I think the best place for these little play areas are in the sitting areas on the, on what do you call that common ground? Um, mm -hmm. You've got some green areas off the road between clumps of houses. That would be the best place to put a little, a little hard top area than way in back where you now have designated for garden, et cetera space. I think, you know, right off where, where you've got the sitting areas, I don't have the map in front of me. That would be a nice place for just a small area where small children can be with their mother sitting under the trees rather than in that big open area in the back. That's what I had in mind. I'm not I'm not worried about big kids. I'm worried about the little kids because you have no more grass and that's an area in the fields where the animals are going through all the time, leaving ticks. And so I think, you know, the, the mode area near the benches where families can sit is a, a better place for small kids to have a place for their baby carriages. And I can't remember what you call those things that kids, before the bicycles, you put your feet down and you ride it around. I can't remember yeah. what it's called, but my age is showing again. Too well, long since I've had grandchildren of that age. So let's let's do this. Let's mark that as something that we on 
that we will discuss when we discuss conditions later on. Um, okay. As opposed to, you know, I think that the, the key thing we're trying to do tonight is to let them to go forward to get the information they need with the certainty they need to get approval from the CONCOM and not have to go back and do an additional test um, and additional money. And so let's let's save that for the conditions discussions and we can talk about it then. Is that okay, Ms. Greenbaum? That's fine with me. Good. As long as it's just a question of hard top. Yeah. And so that would change the numbers. Yeah. Okay. Um, I don't have any other questions. Ms. Allen, do you have anything else you wish to present on this? No, I believe that was it. Um, I defer to Josh to um, correct me if there's anything else that he needs to move forward with his civil plans. I believe I believe that kind of covers everything on our end. So I appreciate uh, the feedback. All right, Ms. Thank Greenbaum. You. Ms. Greenbaum, do you have your hand up or is that? No, I just okay. took off. All right. So what I would like to do is get a sense of the board um, to give you as much certainty as possible without, you know, the final approval of everything. So I'd like to get a sense of the board that this is uh, that we're comfortable with the plans as submitted, with the additional um, um, flexibility that you have on the uh, impermeable space, impervious space, and you can go forward to the concom. So I'd like to I take a motion to that effect that we have a sense of the board that um, we accept the drawings and the site plans as provided and as discussed tonight. Do I have so such moved. a motion? So yeah. moved. Do I have a second? Aye, Mr. Chair. Is there any discussion on, so it's moved and seconded. Is there any discussion on that motion? If not, uh, it's a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Uh, Mr. Henry, aye or nay? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. Great. Uh, Mr. White? Aye. All right. So vote is four to nothing. Uh, the sense of the board has passed. Great. The next thing I'd like to do is go through the um, requested waivers. Um, I think these are ones that um, most, and, and what you want to look at is the revised it's it looks like this it's uh, it's not going to show up very well revised has the red revised that you got in your your packet today um it's not dated but it has a red revised uh, heading on it and it shows some changes from earlier waiver requests most of these in looking through this my perception is that most of these are um you know pretty re required for the building for the uh, the prop comprehensive permit to go forward, many of them are just saying that we're waiving other other uh, portions of either bylaws or town, zoning bylaws or town bylaws, which is what you do in a comprehensive permit. But what I want to do is just run through these without reading everyone and identify if there's any of these that you are bothered by, we, I want to set them aside and talk with about them later. But what I'd like to do is get a sense of the waivers tonight for you and for us as a board, and then set aside those that we that are controversial or you or you have uh, or you oppose, and we can deal with those at a later meeting. The final waivers. So what I'd like to do is get a sense that this is the these are the waivers that are before us, and if they're controversial waivers, we want to deal with them later. Later, we'll vote on the non-controversial waivers or the non the ones that for which there aren't a, a disagreement. We'll vote on those end block uh, in the next meeting or meeting down the road. I think some of us haven't had a chance to go through this much given the holiday season and everything that's been going on. We understand that. So I don't want to force a vote on waivers tonight. And indeed, we may discover, or the applicant may discover that they need to have another waiver in the future. So this could let us go through all of these. Um, we can start with the first ones, Rob, and just run through them quickly. Um, but that's what I would like to accomplish tonight. Is that clear, Mr. Henry? Is that clear? It, it does. I, I do have a question. It's it's yep. not one of the ones that has a revision attached to it. It's actually the second one under 3.2830. Yep. Um, to waive the requirement as no public way is being created. Um, 
I just need some clarification on what that means, because um, my interpretation of a public way in the legal definition is where the public has a right of access, which um, this would be. So I'm, I'm a little bit confused by that one. It says no public way is being created. I can I can answer that and respond. Um, Ms. So under the Mass General Law, there is a definition for public way that's very specific, and it means that it's a it has it's a road that needs to meet the subdivision standards. Um, it is a road that is plowed by the town. Um, it is owned by the town. So the pedestrian way is is not for vehicles. It's not a public way in the in that it meets subdivision regs. It doesn't meet the definition of a public way under Mass General Law. It's designed to be for pedestrians only. So the waiver is just for the pedestrian way. The waiver is to is to say that we are not creating a subdivision because we are not creating a public way. We are not creating a subdivision road. I'm going to let the planner speak. It, it looks like what you're saying is we're not creating a subdivision by virtue of creating a public way. Is that right? You're all right. Who's we've got two staff, both Christine and Rob, have raised their hand. Rob. Yeah, so every time, um, so under the subdivision control law, every time you create, um, say, like at least two or more lots off a given piece of land, you have to construct a road. Um, a lot of the times that road is considered a privately owned road. So in this situation, they are claiming that they are not creating a public way that's going to be turned over to the town in the future. So usually with a lot of these subdivision roads, you um you you create it and then you hope one day the town takes it over in the future. But they're basically saying that they're not going to create this pedestrian way to ever be taken over by the town. They're going to keep it a private way in perpetuity and essentially own, managed, and plowed by the homeowners association. Does that make sense? It it does. Okay. Okay. Ms. Bresto. I don't seem to have access. Oh, there's my little raise hand button. I see it got um, covered up. So I just wanted to explain that um, in this particular instance, the farmland conservation district requires that if you do create a residential subdivision, you are required to use the cluster subdivision form of development. So the point that's being made by Valley CDC here is that they are not creating a residential subdivision, and therefore they do not need to use the cluster subdivision form of development. They are not dividing the property into lots. They are using one lot for the entire project. So I think that's the point that they're trying to get across here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, some of the other, we can, I don't think it's necessary to walk through each one, but if people have questions, they should raise them. It's a good time to raise them. Some of these deal with agricultural um, issues, most of which are resolved by the fact that this, this farmland is, the, the land has already been used for other purposes and it, it, in and of itself, it wasn't, um, it wasn't viable farmland. Also that there's, um, there is a question about whether there's on-site, whether there's nearby active um, farming or whether there's um, and on, on 94, 96 Summer Street. Just run through the change on that for us, would you, Ms. Allen? Sure, that was a recommendation from the planning staff. Um, I was yeah. not aware that there were farming operations happening at 94 to 96 Summer Street. And so yep. that was flagged by planning and um, it has been amended as such. So that there, what that is saying is there are active farming. Okay, yep. So, whoops, Rob, you can keep those up if you would. I just want to give people a minute uh, just to run through them. Do you want me to scroll down very slowly, Mr. Chair, or do you want me to just yeah. stay on the first page? Okay. I'm, I've gone through the first page. Uh, let's go into the second page. Okay. Ms. Murray? Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and my apologies to Rob, because I wanted to just go back to the um, active farming operation, because um, this will apply to this uh, particular waiver as well as others. 
So you see where the zoning bylaw says that no building containing dwelling units shall intrude into a minimum 150 foot buffer strip separating the residential uses from the adjacent farmland. And they're seeking a waiver from that. Typically we would, what, what I would ask the ZBA to do or I'd ask the developer to do is identify for us, okay, well, what is the closest setback? How far into that 150 foot buffer will this development intrude so that the ZBA isn't simply just granting the waiver, um, or at least I assume we're not simply going to grant the waiver, but rather we would grant the waiver subject to the plan shown or subject to an understanding that the closest building shall be located, for example, 75 feet from the active farming operations, just so that I'm thinking of your building inspector, mm -hmm. when, you know, building permits are suddenly being applied for saying, gee, you know, is how close can this building go um, be intruding into that farmland buffer? And there are other uh, waivers as we start to get into more dimensional requirements that, again, it'd be my preference that we specify exactly how many feet. If, if we are seeking a waiver from some sort of dimensional requirement that we do specify what it is the board is waiving. Um, obviously it's uh, the board's decision and, and I'll defer to however the board wants to structure this. Would it, I mean, that's one, so it's a question for this and for other um, waivers. What would be the downside of saying as reflected on the, the plans approved by the, by the ZB, the comprehensive the site plans approved in the comprehensive permit by the ZBA, as opposed to having individual um, limits of set out in feet? The, the only difference I suppose would be um, if something is not clearly marked on the plan, for example. So I realize we have a scale and we certainly do, you know, right now we just have sort of what, you know, preliminary drawings and ultimately they're going to have to get more detailed for purposes of the, um, you know, for purposes of seeking a building permit. But it could very well be that you look at these concept drawings now and you say, well, I know it's a 150 foot buffer from an, an active farming location. Um, looks to me like they're 75 feet away. That's still a pretty good buffer. But suppose in actuality, by the time it gets to final construction documents, suppose, and I'm gonna just use a gross exaggeration here. Suppose it's now the structure is 10 feet away from active farming how would that discrepancy be resolved? It would have to come back to the Zoning Board of Appeals to see whether or not, you know, when we grant a waiver, are we granting a waiver completely from the 150 feet? Mm -hmm. Or does the board only feel comfortable granting a waiver from the 150 feet provided no dwelling is any closer than 25 feet to the active farming operations? Something like that, for example. Um, I see it actually come up more often in things like when there's a request for a waiver from um, like a roadway le length. And we might have a subdivision requirement that says, you know, a roadway uh, can be no longer, you know, a roadway ending in a cul-de-sac, for example, can be no longer than a thousand feet. And we just waive it. Well, how long can the road be? 2,000 feet, 3,000 mm -hmm. feet? You know, we haven't quite specified. So. That's the only particular downside, Mr. Chair, is I think that I if the building commissioner can't interpret it, it winds up back before this board. And uh, Lord knows we don't want to have it back before the board if we don't need it. To be, <laughs> right. right. So here's what I would suggest. Um, why don't, for the next meeting, why don't you and the staff get together and identify the areas where you'd have cut, you know, split the difference between what the existing, what the, what the um, site plan shows and what the limit is supposed to be. You know, if it's supposed to be 150 and they're at uh, right about 150, give them to 75 or whatever, whatever number you wish, but kind of split the difference. So there's a little bit of flexibility in case of, there has to be a change, but, but I don't know how, I mean, and then come up with that and propose it to the board. I think that would make some sense. Um, I don't want to create a whole lot of work on that. You know, it, it could be an awful lot of work, but 
Um, it would make sense to me to do it that way. Otherwise, um, it just, you got to approve the plans and it could vary. So that seems to me, is that something that uh, can be done, Ms. Prestrup? I think we could do that. We could look at exactly where the farming is and um, make a recommendation about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's, let's try that and see if that makes sense. And then um, just to make this point, um, once the buildings are built, if someone decides to farm closer than a, whatever the limit is, that's on them. That's, uh, what do you call it, coming to the nuisance or coming something? Coming to the nuisance, yes. Right, yeah. Oh. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, okay. Well, that's a new phrase to me. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Yes. Ms. Greenbaum. I, yeah, Chris answered one of my questions. What if somebody builds a farm closer than um, than it is now? That was and Chris handled that one. Um, yeah. I'm wondering. This is the first time I've seen this with the red lines all over. It. So, can uh, can you have Rob show us where on Summer Street that farm is on the town map? I actually have it pulled up on GIS. Would you like me to share my screen? Yes, please. Yes. I don't know what all the why the blue lines popped up. I still have a hard time navigating your GIS system. Um, but this is our property here, and this is oh. back here. I personally, in the number of times I've been to that site, I haven't seen any active farming happening there. Um, there is an old, um, like a farming shed that's in the back, but um, I'm not sure what there, what, I think there used to be goats there is my understanding. And I don't see any more goats there. Yeah. Um, okay. I just did, I, I didn't, you know, having driven by there 50 years now, I uh, don't remember seeing any farming on summer street so that's why I asked. yeah there is a little shed in the way back there i think there were it was goats at one point but i'm sure others in town have more knowledge than i okay thank you miss mm -hmm. Bresco. so i had a question about um could you bring the map back um sure Alan. yeah sure. there were two properties on what is that mill street um and i think the one that's 5b160 might have farming on it and this so we should probably go out and look at those properties and see what's if there's any farming going on there so rob wachilla and i should take a field trip out there to check that and then we'll be able to talk about this more uh, clearly next time we meet okay Feel free to park on our property if you need to. Thank you. Okay. Thanks for the catch, uh, Ms. Murray. We appreciate that. Um, let's move to the second page. So the first one is just says, is granting a waiver from the need to get a special permit because you got a comprehensive permit. The next one, three, two, one, two, um, waves that need for site plan review because you have a comprehensive permit. Uh, three, two, one, two, affordable duplex. This list, you know, that it says that the current says that they don't have to be owner occupied. We want to waive that because every one of these is going to be owner occupied. And the essence is what we're talking about in that. Uh, waiver 4.11 is this is this similar to what we were discussed before public or private statutory ways the streets are defined by the Amherst board if I may it is um that there are no lots here that are being created so it's all one yep. it's all one lot and that one light has frontage on pulpit hill road and montague road Got it. The next one deals with the amount of, of cut and fill, uh, which has been laid out in the comprehensive permit. Um, 
and I and I guess you just is it clear that you're going to be doing more than what's permitted, or is it just that, that um, why do we need this one? I guess, Ms. Allen. Part of it is that this is a conservative approach for waivers to right. make sure that I don't miss anything, to be honest. So yeah. um, so if there's things that at the end of the day we don't need, um, that's fine. This, um, this original waiver list was drafted with the project eligibility letter before we were final with design plans. So um, we can take a look again at that cut and fill and I can confer with the civil team and see whether that's a waiver that we need. Okay, but we've we've reviewed we've gotten your subsequent plans on cut and fill. We've explored them on the already in one of the meetings. We didn't find a problem with it. I just wanted to know why we. Why we need I don't it. believe so. I think that we were within the thresholds, but I see the planners have their hands up, and so they have more okay. information than I do. <laughs> All right, uh, Mr. Wachilla. Yeah, so I guess one thing to consider is that there was a problem raised before the project was submitted regarding a high water table on the site. So you might want to account for the fact that they could exceed 5,000 square feet of fill because they have to get above a certain number of feet of that high water table. Mm -hmm. I, I think last time I heard, Jessica, I don't know if this is correct. I don't know if it's three feet of fill you're going to put in a lot of areas or something like that. Um, um, I, I don't recall off the top of my head. This is why okay. we have a civil team and we can bring Josh yeah. back on if needed. But um. I, and I can certainly pull up the cut and fill plan and look at those numbers. Um, well, that's not that's yeah. not necessary. I'm just saying, okay. like, I'm just trying to prove the point that it's probably important to keep that waiver in there in case they have okay. to exceed that threshold. Um, is the point I was trying to make. Thank you. Okay, Ms. Bresto. So I wanted to go back to the one that has to do with four point one one and ask uh, Ms. Murphy, Ms. Murray. Um, about the A and R lot that's going to be carved off, and should we mention that where we say you know to waive the requirement as no public, private, or building lots are being proposed, should we acknowledge that there is going to be um, an A and R lot? It's not a building lot in the sense that it already has a building on it, but um, maybe there should be some wording in there to acknowledge that lot will be part of the comprehensive permit. And I'm not exactly sure. I don't have a fully formed thought about that, but I think we should look at that and figure out some wording that allows that A and R lot to be uh, created. And, and thank you, Christine, because when I read this uh, waiver list and read this provision, I actually thought this was uh, put in there for the A and R lot. I wasn't thinking of the you know the the, the balance of the development. But to, to answer your question, yes, I think we can add some language here um, to also recognize um, that this will be for that existing single family lot off of Ball Lane, which is um, which is, is going to be carved off as a result of this. So I think we can, we could do that separately. Um, okay, thank you. Okay. Thank you. Good. Um, 6.24, uh, yeah, you know, you need, you have a higher fence than the, the, the four foot fence along the lot lines. And that's requested by the, it's really there for the neighbor preference. Mm -hmm. um, 6.26, again, you don't, you, this requires you get a building permit, but you're getting a comprehensive permit, so you don't need, you're getting a waiver from this. Um, these next two are new. Can you just run through those quickly for us, Ms. Allen? Sure, this was due to my omission, the original submission of the A and R. Um, this is that so, this deals with the A and R lots, right? This has to do with the A and R lot and planning yeah. department advised that it would be considered as a flag lot um, and to request waivers through the section of the zoning which discusses flag lots. So um the first one is to the the language is to um is if a lot is included within a definitive subdivision plan, we don't have a definitive subdivision yeah. plan, so I'm acknowledging that. Um, yeah. And then the second one is if it's not part of an approved definitive subdivision plan, may be allowed by a special permit. Again, acknowledging that a special permit wouldn't be needed because we have the comprehensive permit. Yeah. Um, and then the third one, um, 
is with the dimensions. And so we are in the process of getting an a &R plan. Um, I understand the surveyors were out there this week. Um, so we should have that in hand and that that's to address uh, attorney Murray's um, comment earlier about having um, a graphic showing that. Um, so we will have an AR plan, it's just in the works. Um, so this is granting a waiver from the dimensional requirements um, for a flag law in the farming district, the farming conservation district. Mm -hmm. uh, we meet the frontage requirements, but not the required lot area or building circle area. So the, the A&R plan will show that. And, um, and that is what that waiver is for. Great. The next two deal with exemptions from um, building coverage and lot coverage. So there, just how much of the building coverage are you are you proposing to have? It's more than ten percent. Can Jim, what's that number? Just so we know how much we're exceeding. Again, I'd I need to d rely on my design team to pull the numbers off the plans directly, so I can certainly do that. Okay, just I I think it's for my information only. You know, I think it has to be it needs to be waived. Otherwise, you can't do the development. So. Um, Parking spaces, uh, this next three are all for parking. You need to have a, we're granting you a waiver. You're asking for a waiver from requirements for parking spaces, uh, having landscaped open spaces and raised curbs. Um, it's just not in your plan. Um, I don't have a problem with that. I don't know if anybody else does. Um, 7.70 is access requirements in driveways and flag lots. Um, since you don't really have a driveway, you're asking for a waiver from that. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. Uh, the, normally you're required to have a turnaround. You don't have a turnaround, but you have the, you've accommodated a fire truck all the way through and emergency vehicles all the way through through so the pedestrian way. So that you're, you're getting asking for a waiver from that. Street addresses, they're not going to be street addresses. They're going to be, um, unit numbers and you're at, and in fact, you're asking for a waiver to accommodate that. Mm -hmm. Um, you're saying that you don't want to be required to have a bicycle rack and you want it that can be left up to the homeowners association in the future if they want to build bicycle racks is that correct so you want a waiver from that requirement mm -hmm. you want to waive the requirement for a comprehensive special permit under 10.3 because you have i mean for a special permit because you have a comprehensive permit that's mm -hmm. yeah right site plan review you're waiving requirements for a site plan review because we have a comprehensive permit may i ask a question um, yes, yes. Go ahead, Mr. Henry. Uh, on the on the bike rack provision. Yep. The side in that the developers are asking for a waiver. Is there something? Will this be something in the permit that allows the homeowners to put one in without the need to come back here? Um hmm. well we could certainly it could certainly be located where the community facilities area is located. Um if that was the desire of the community to put in a bike rack at that location. Our okay. thought was that these home that homeowners would generally, if they have bikes, are probably going to be storing them in their houses. It's not like it's a rental property where there's no place to sort of bring it into your apartment. You have your home. And so that was our thought. That's okay. You know, we could, we could yeah. have a condition that's Mr. Henry, we could have a condition that said that um, additional addition of bike racks is an insubstantial change. And um, it would it could be approved by the building commissioner. Wouldn't have to come back to us. I, I think that will make sense. Okay, Rob, can we let's let's create a condition that does that? Yeah, we'll and take I, note of that. Um, yeah, I also had one. Yes, yeah, so I wanted to ask about uh, section eight, the zoning bylaw, which deals with our. It's basically our sign bylaw. So yep. I know I kind of brought up earlier yep. that the applicant should have signage on the property directing um i guess the mail truck to each mailbox to pay on like who's getting what or what the unit number is going to be so i don't know if you know there are plans to put additional signage anywhere else on the property but and chris please correct me if i'm wrong on this um because you know the zoning bylaw better than i do but um would it make sense and this is me kind of asking the applicant if you know you request a uh waiver from section a of the zoning bylaw in terms of placement of signs and the types of signs you're allowed to have. Uh, Chris, if you wanna you know, correct me on that, please jump in. 
Mr. Judge? Yes, Ms. Ms. Bradstrup, yeah. go ahead. Um, I think it's definitely worth saying something about Section 8, um, Article 8 of the Zoning Bylaw with regard to signs and granting a waiver from the particular detailed requirements of Section 8 may make a lot of sense. On the other hand, I think that the board will probably want to see the sign plan once it's developed. And some of those signs will have to do with parking, and some of the signs will have to do with perhaps a sign at each entryway saying Amherst Community Homes, whatever you want to say. So um, having a condition that having a condition that requires a sign plan to come back to the board, but also granting a waiver from the minutia of Article 8 would probably make sense. Um, and that sign plan could be done at a public meeting, correct? That's right, yeah. yeah. That approval would be, would require a hearing, public hearing. Okay. Good. So just for my clarification um, to the planners, you're suggesting an entire uh, a waiver from the entire signs article or are there specific provisions? We don't know what you're proposing, so it's hard yeah. to. Um, We're not proposing any any major signage at all at this are point. Are you proposing a sign at the entry drives that say Amherst Community Homes or no, anything? No, we are not. No. So you're just proposing um, parking signs? Yep, and I believe if we go back to the site plans, I believe there were some signage already in there. Will, will there be signage for, for example, there's a section, there's half of the units on one side and half on the other. There's no signage to indicate the unit numbers. Um, we haven't considered that, but we could certainly consider that. <laughs> that seems like a smart plan yeah, that to do to that. Sense. You know, to at least have signage that say unit numbers whatever through whatever on this side and then the other side is the other one side. through 15 and, and yep. 16 through 30. Yep. I think that would make sense. It would make sense both for visitors as well as for deliveries and mail. Sure. Yep. yep. Absolutely. And yep. it makes sense if you're going to have two separate mailboxes. Yep. yep. All right. Go ahead, Mr. Henry. Rob has his hand up. Okay. Rob. I've been talking a lot this meeting. Um, so, uh, I guess the one thing I want to ask the board is that for this condition pertaining to the public meeting requirement for any additional signage, um, I mean, should we, since Valley doesn't really have a sign plan at all for us right now, do you think we should just make the condition that um, maybe they come back at a public meeting with proposed sign layout and the board can approve it at the public meeting? Um, and just kind of go from there and also kind of incorporate the signage as well for, for the mailman so they know which mailbox to go to? Or do you think that's not necessary? You know, I think that my opinion would be the best would be to come up with a sign plan in the mm -hmm. next month and then present it to us and we can approve it. If that's not possible, then a condition that says, uh, you, didn't get it, you didn't have it done by the time of the comprehensive permit, we don't, it was voted on, we don't want to delay the comprehensive permit just on based on signs. So come back to us with the sign plan and at a public meeting and we can approve it. So, but the best would be to come up with something in the next month that would that would work. Mr. So Chair, could you um yeah. could you clarify what you mean by sign plan, please, for the applicant's sake? So, plans that a, a rendering of a, I think a sign at both entrances, so I mean, which units are there. And sign saying something to the effect that parking is for residents only or something like and visitors, whatever the whatever they're gonna use for a um, a parking management plan, what's their envision. That's what I kind of think. Um, in terms of I don't think we I we do require that they have unit numbers on the units. That's yeah. gonna be required by the by the mm -hmm. you know the fire department needs that. But I don't don't know if we need much more than units 1 through 15 and 16 through 30 on the two entryways. Well, the applicant could also, if they were good with Photoshop or copy and pasting on images, that could be considered a sign rendering as well, right? Yeah. I mean, do they have to be professionally done? Okay, that makes no, sense. No, no, it, it can. It, I don't think that's so important, just the fact that I yeah. think it should be there and make sure that it's, that, that it's um, you know, attractive and a, Photoshop could work. 
Okay. Just to clarify also, the site plans do have some signage already in them for yep. parking. So the handicap parking, right. um, there's a signpost detail for the stop sign for the do not yep. enter sign and for the authorized vehicles only for the pedestrian way. So, and those are already marked on the site plan. So that you, the locations and the details for those are already in the original submission. So all, all I think we're really talking about is one through 15 and 16 through 30. Sure. Okay. Somebody else has a Miss Breshva. I think it would still be worthwhile to um, grant a waiver from the requirements of Article Eight, just in case you get hung up on the number of signs or the square footage of signs or whatever kind of details are in that article. There are requirements for no more than X square feet of sign allowed per lot in a residential district and you don't want to get hung up on no more than 12 square feet or whatever it is so i think giving the zba the opportunity to review a sign plan and then approve the sign plan makes complete sense but you don't want them to have to adhere to the you know the details of article 8 and so granting a waiver from that in my mind makes sense okay good all right. So we're, let's see, where are we now? Um, we've gone through special permits. Excavations on the public way, uh, you need a waiver because you're going to be creating a driveway, I mean, a uh, passageway into the, or a road into the development, correct? Is that what the waivers 3.30 are, are about? Yes, yeah, so Mr. Chair, um, this section right here that you just read off is from the Amherst General Bylaws. Um, yeah. And this one, I believe, is for a curb cut. Um, mm -hmm. So I think the applicant is getting a waiver from adhering to the uh, requirements of obtaining a permit and approval from the town to do so. And because I believe that's the next permit. Yep. Cause he got a comp permit. Um, I think the next two or three um, pertain to that as yep. well. But same thing with the fire department. Mm -hmm. um, we have that with the sidewalks. And we have trees on the site. We've talked about that. Oh, Ms. Greenbaum. Hilda, you're muted. I want to get back to the other page where it talks about bike racks. Okay. I can't, where is it? Oh, okay. Um, I'm concerned about if you have a, a, a subdivision here or group houses, family housing, there's certainly going to be kids with bicycles in excess of the owner's bicycles that come and visit or what. I think there should be a place to put them. And they shouldn't, you know, have to just leave their bikes on the lawn. It might be bad, you know, snowy weather or whatever and and kids obviously have friends that are going to come on some kind of a vehicle and we should know about that and provide a place for them if we won't, don't want them strewn around on the grass. Um, the 30 families is going to be kids. Hopefully. Because you're talking at least uh at least 60 or more kids, maybe. If they have to have a kid or there for somebody in every bedroom. Or even adults come on bicycles, and maybe more and more so in the future. Mr. Wise, we, oh, go we ahead. should talk go. about that, I think. You don't have to talk to the side now, but I think we should come back to that. It's not an expensive thing. That's why I'm making a point about it. It was very useful. Keep the place looking neat, and cut down on, you know, ruining grass. 
and you know you try a couple hundred bucks of that. Mr. Wachilla, so can we come back? Okay. Let's come back to it. Not waste. We'll time come back. To, but I, yeah, Mr. Wachilla. I just want to clarify that um, what Ms. Greenbaum is bringing up could definitely be discussed in the conditions portion, yeah. um, because I think she's trying to talk about publicly shared bicycle racks at each entry point of the the common drive. But yeah, we can move on and come back to that later. We can put that in conditions. Yep. So that means you would waive it and then then require it. Is, is, is that what you're saying? It could be. So you could waive the strict application of section 7.8, but the board and correct me if I'm, if I'm correct on this, Carolyn, but the board could condition that they have bike racks placed at reasonable spots on the property. Is that, is the board allowed to do that? The board is yes, Rob, okay. because they, you know, to what you were saying before the waiver would be, the waiver from the literal application and interpretation of section 7.8. And if the board then decides that we want to sprinkle smaller bike racks, let's say throughout the development and where we only want to have one where maybe two would have been required, mm -hmm. um, it, it would be within conditions to do that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Henry, is there a list of conditions similar to this list that we're considering? I, I did not see that. Those there are a list of conditions that were um, in the meeting packet, and that was it's called a decision document, um, and it's was prepared. Uh, let's see. So Everett, they're actually um, they were in the digital meeting packet uploaded a few days ago, so it's possible you may not have checked it recently, and yeah. they could and have been uploaded after facts. I, I don't really want to spend a whole lot of time going over all the conditions tonight oh. because nobody's had a chance to really review them. No, that's fine. That was not the intent. Just wanted to make sure that there was somewhere okay. I could read them. Yep. Yeah. And Ms. Murray put together that first draft of those conditions and, and uh, I, I found it. Good. Good. Okay. And if I could just add, Mr. Chair, it was a very preliminary first draft. Yeah. I fully expect, <laughs> especially after tonight's discussion, uh, we fully ex believe me. I expect I'm going to be revising this over the weekend. No, that's first takes. That's and it was a good first take. So thank you. Can uh, I ask a question? Oh, go, yes, Miss Allen. No, 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 yeah. no. Go ahead, Miss Allen. Um, I just wanted to ask a question to Attorney Murray because um, the planning staff were gracious enough to provide us with a copy for us to have a preliminary review. And um, our attorney and I, we've gone through it and we definitely have some questions. Would it be helpful for us for you to see those when, when in terms of your revisions? Um, as soon as you want to share them would be okay. great. Because okay. it may very well be that I completely agree with you and, and maybe we work through it very easily. Sure. Um, and we can just narrow it down to maybe whatever we really need to discuss further. Okay, thank you. Sure. Okay. All right, uh, let's move on. So uh, we are at sidewalks, trees on the site, because um, you have you have a plan. I, I, other restrictions on the trees on the site, um, it should really be governed by the comprehensive plan, comprehensive permit, I mean. Um, let's see, we are at subdivision section 6.L. Two in parens. There's a no public way, so you need to have, you don't you want an exemption from a public way requirements. Landscaping guidelines. Um, has the tree warden looked at? Has the tree warden looked at your plan? Do you know? I'm not sure if he's in the main distribution list that the town sends to all of the. Um... It looks like the answer is yes from planning department. Yep. Okay. So, um, and we've, and we've seen the plan, the yep. landscaping plan. Yep. And so the tree warden didn't flag any concerns right. from his end. He did get a copy of the transmittal. And, la and then last are the, uh, there's two on sewer and water connections. Mm -hmm. um, you're asking for a waiver requiring approval from the departments. 
That's because you'll get it through the comprehensive permit again. And lastly, development. I don't know what development per plans are. What does that mean even? What does the word per mean? Does that mean development as by the plans or as per a term of art? Um, can't remember. Um, is this a general waiver of, of everything? Mr. Chair, that's how I read this, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I, I welcome yeah, I just wonder. <laughs> I, I, I know, think we I might use, need to look at that. Yeah, I think um, part yeah. of it is I used the East Gable waivers as a guideline to make sure that I was capturing all of the general. Um, and that may have been something that I pulled from East Gables. Yeah. Um, I, this is one I think we'll, that I would ask Ms. Murray and the planning staff to take a look at. When I went through this, I was confused and I thought it might be really bro broader than you need. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's one that I would that's one that I would flag. Can we just run through the the waivers that we we want to kind of look at? Go ahead, Rob. Do you have a list of the first well, of all? You have a question, and I ask you if you have a list. It's okay. Um, so I kind of want to clarify these subdivision ones real quick, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so basically, there are standards for subdivisions where the sidewalks and the roadway have to be a certain length, and then you have to abide by. Um, certain standards set forth in the subdivision control law, um, the applicant's effectively asking to get a waiver from all of those. So they're not limited to certain curb cut lengths, certain sidewalk lengths or widths and roadway uh, widths. So that's kind of the main thing for these three um, waivers right here. Thank you. I just wanted to point that out to the board. So what I, I think would be helpful, Rob, you've probably already done this, but mm -hmm. There, are, I think there are a few that need to be revised and come back to us. Okay. Um, maybe Ms. Murray has also done that. I mm -hmm. think the ANR one, I think the, um, you're just going to get us the numbers on lot coverage and building coverage just so we have it uh, before us, but I, I don't see the change to that. Um, then this last one we have to, it all, we're also looking at. We had, other, one, yeah. we had one about the buffer zone of against yeah, farm buffer zone exactly yep. good catch so those are the three that you pointed out mr chair you have the a and r waiver that needs to be included you have the last waiver mentioned here that's a little bit vague and confusing and then you have the buffer zone for the farmland that's nearby I, am i missing anything or are those the only three that we discussed are we are we There's good the on the a and r the bike rack? Uh, bike rack. Bike rack. So we have to add. Also, I think we talked about adding a waiver from Article 8 as well of, of the signed bylaw. And are you guys good with the ANR? For that, that one lot? You don't need anything more on that? Some new language that Miss Murray is going to come up okay. with for that waiver. Yep. We got that as well. Okay. Um, so, Mr. Did Chair, I'm sorry, go ahead. You got yeah. to talk about whatever language I had given you to come back to. So, um, Mr. Chair, in yeah. terms of the bike rack waiver, um, I guess more clarification on what we're looking for from the applicant. Are we, are we expecting them just to modify the language of that particular waiver? Or what exactly was the, and Chris, you can back me up if I'm missing it. Like, what was the intention of bringing that up um, just now? Um, you wanted a waiver from the exact requirements in Section 7, but then you wanted the ability to add a condition later on that may right. require bike racks to go in certain locations, but you haven't gotten to that point yet. Because yeah. that would be in the condition. Yeah. So, so you wouldn't. So just to I, clarify, you wouldn't have to change that waiver at all. You could just leave that waiver the same and then just, yeah. yeah. Okay. A blanket one. Waiver? Yes. So that, that waiver basically exempts the requirements of 7.8 for, for this project, but the board does okay. have the ability to condition later on. So I guess okay. what all I'm right. trying to say is the applicant does not have to change that waiver. They can leave that one that's the a, same. That's a condition okay. issue. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Just wanted to clarify that. Yep. All right. 
Anything else from the members or staff or applicant? Ms. Greenbaum. Yeah, this time I had it up. Um, did you, I, I, in that latest conversation, I didn't understand or hear whether you said anything about um, making a provision for a top lot that might not be on that space where the community gardens was sited. We were going to come back and talk about that. Well, you know, the, the issue for the, and I want Chris and Rob to correct me if I'm wrong, seems the issue for the tot lot and that community space, for anything in that community space, including a building or a tot lot, is the extent to which it increases the impervious structures, the impervious coverage. And, and that's, that is the issue that's been raised by the applicant. They need to have, a, they want to have a little bit of, uh, they have to identify how much square footage they have that's available that they can cover and not um, violate the stormwater plans. That's the issue. The, the second issue is what is put out there and should it be decided in the, by, in the comprehensive permit as to what is out there or should it be left up to the the homeowners association to decide they want to put in a, a building, a community center, or they want to put in a tot lot, or they want to do something. I think those are the two issues. And I don't think in either case that has to be part of the waiver discussion. It seems to me that that's probably should be part of the conditions discussions. And okay. we can decide. Yeah, I think that's, and Chris or Rob, is that right. your understanding of the issue? Okay. Just one, one follow-up to that. So I don't we're not think... voting on any location. We're just load, voting on a square footage. Yes. doesn't matter right. where it is. They can divide well, that space up if they want. So it has to be within that geographical area they outline on their plans. So basically, right. you're allowing for them to build any reasonable structure inside that circle without having to come back to revise the comp permit. So in other words, the little common areas where I was talking about where there was like a small park, um, they, they could or they could not, um, a small square footage of hard turf, hard surface. So go in those other commonly shared areas that aren't that circular area north of the developments, they would have to come back because they would deviate from the original site plan. Are you talking about the pockets that aren't on pocket each of the parts. units? Okay. Yeah, are you talking, the little are pocket you... box there. So the okay. very small children don't have to be taught it's okay to ride in the road. So you're talking about the commonly shared green space areas that aren't owned or segmented for each unit. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. but on way back in the field. Yeah, near the units. It's um, for very small children. You're talking about the areas that are off the pedestrian walkway, the commonly yes. areas that run through the center of the development. Yeah. Um, it may just be the little area off, you know, like a little driveway area right off the road that's the or pathway, whatever it calls. It's there. I, I, I'm just wondering if. So, so right now, the way we're think, talking about common area impacts, or or can that square footage be applied to a place like the common the parkway area rather than the area way in back, which could be used by bigger people than littler people? I expect there's going to be a lot of kids there. Okay, so what you're sure. talking about is if we have X amount of square footage that can be, that's excess impervious surfaces. Yeah. Right? Can it be placed anywhere or can it be placed just where the, in the circle behind north of the buildings? That's, yeah. I think that's your question. Uh, and, yeah, yeah, because right? they may want to put something by the mailbox, for example. So I, but the question for me is, does that affect the stormwater plan that the, that the um, applicant has to get 
and the and compound. So is it does it make a difference as to how many square feet it, where and where that square feet is is located? Yes. Or can it be any place? And I, I don't have an answer to that in terms of this. Well, that's, that's sort of what I'm trying to say. But I don't so Ms. Know Allen, Ms. Allen, can you answer that question for us? Or um, When or? we discussed it as a design team, it was our intent to have it be in that one location and to really preserve those common lawn areas as real pockets right. of open space and gathering spaces. We feel like it really yep. breaks up those little mini neighborhoods. And mm -hmm. so our envision really was to identify one location which could be used for any number of different activities as the residents um, as the residents desire. Um, I would have to consult with the civil team to see yeah. whether changing locations impacts the stormwater. I mean, you are calculating flows to a certain location that are gathering mm -hmm. in a certain way. So it may have some impact. That's why I think consolidating everything into one location really sort of helps um, make it a more efficient stormwater plan rather than having these little pockets. And again, as a design team, we really felt like preserving those pockets and preserving that open space was important to the how of the design. So the, the answer then is for, ne for our next meeting, Ms. Allen, can you get from your uh, civil guys the effect of having movable square footage <laughs> around or I don't you know, as opposed to having it located just in that one area if that affects the the stormwater calculations right that's the question that we have from the board member yeah well, I, can, uh, I can ask our civil our team yep Mr. Wachilla so I guess to touch base on what Ms. Greenbaum was talking about as well I think you know we're, we're proposing a condition to where you can't exceed an additional number of square footage for a public or a shared facility. So she's saying, say if you're, if you cap it at 50,000 square feet, again, I'm just guessing, I'm making up numbers. Um, you build something that's 40,000 square feet. Can you still use that additional 10,000 square feet for other areas on site? And I think that's a good question she brings up. The only thing is how is the board going to apply that and whether or not you want the neighborhood development association or the sorry the condominium association to come back to modify the permit so i think one thing we can do is for the conditions is to word a condition where or maybe add on to the condition to pertain to the public facility that they build in that little circle what they can do with that excess square footage and i guess a process for doing so without having to come back to the board for say like a, a mini pocket park that has a playset or something and that would be something located outside of that circle. So say if like, you know, one of those small green space areas right off the main pathway that's commonly owned or commonly shared, you know, why not put like a swing set there or something? You know, would you really want them to come back to revise a comp permit for a swing set? No. No. So I think that's something that maybe, you know, uh, Chris and Carolyn and I could discuss as something we can add as a condition. Um, and I think that was actually a pretty important point that Ms. Greenbaum brought up. Can can I just add um, a little bit to the thought process is that, you know, the whole intent is that we are getting homeowners that are really going to be establishing a community and staying here and will be living in these in these homes for 30 years, hopefully. So they may have kids in the beginning and that swing set might be great in the beginning, but maybe 30 years from now, that swing set has lived its lifespan as a structure. And so what happens then if like something wants to come down and how are those calculations sort of configured with that? So I'm just unfortunately adding more complexity to the conversation, but um, I think it's important to think about that this isn't just like a one point in time that we're really trying to establish something that's gonna be here for generations. And so how do, as structures evolve and things change, how does that, how does this impact these sort of square foot numbers that we're, we're hitting on? So. And I think the other question that we have to be thinking about is we want to empower the owners to make the decisions about what they want in their community. And we want to give them flexibility to do that without having a lot of um, need to come back to the ZBA or need to come back to town for anything that's a minor change. And to their owners, they ought to be able to do that as long as it's, and, and that's, that's one of the things that we want to do. So that's, that's the tension that we're, we're looking at here, Ms. Greenbaum, I think, is 
is how specific do we want to be and how, how much flexibility and do we want to give to the, the new owners to design what they want? Well, I would yeah. like them to yep. be able to design what they want. And if they want to change um, these little areas to a bocce court from what was for little tots, that's their issue. And it shouldn't have to come back to the planning uh, zoning yeah. board. So I mean, bocce carts, who knows what they maybe want to use these little areas for pickleball, who knows? But they shouldn't <laughs> have to come to us to ask. But we should <laughs> not, not be denying them outright at the big beginning of having the oh. flexibility of doing what they want to do. Right. Yeah. And I, have to get yeah. all in that one place in the back doesn't make sense for a lot of things, especially yeah, he, if, you know, you got tech issues. You know, keeping the flexibility there for the owner, homeowners association, I think, is an important thing that we should. I think most of us share. It's an important. I hope thing. I set up clearly. Yep. Okay. So, I think we've done. I've we've gone through the waivers. We've got some. We've identified some of the additional information we could use, and since we're going to be a while for the next meeting, Miss Allen, I think it gives you time to work with the staff and the staff to come up with um, some uh, some recommendations for us or at least alternatives for us for that. I, I sense that um, board members have not had a chance to look at the conditions um, that were in the decision document. And I, and I don't think it, I, it's not optimal to kind of wing it the first time through and so what I would ask board members to do is to take a look at that, um, this, that decision document and beginning on page seven and going through about page uh, 18 or 19, 17 or 18 are a, a bunch of conditions that Ms. Murray has come up with and working with the staff they've come up with. Um, they're all the, they're a lot of the issues that we have to deal with, everything from local preference to um, the uh, the um, transfer of ownership, um, depending upon 100 or 80 percent, there's a bunch of there's parking. There's a, a bunch of issues that we may have some discuss. We may need to have some discussion about. But I don't know how valuable it is to get into those today on everybody on their first impression while we're in this meeting. So if unless there's an objection, what I would suggest to the members of the board is take a look to have this distributed again and maybe in paper, the next version in paper to all of us ahead of time if we could, Rob, you know, um, the next meeting won't be till February, so we've got some time to do this, but to get the next uh, iteration of this out, and it won't be significantly different than this one, but get the next iteration of this out to members a week ahead of time on paper as well as electronically, and they can take a look at it, and we can have a discussion about conditions at our next meeting. I don't, the concern about that, that's my preference. I would not do that if we think that this is going to cause such a delay that it's going to affect your construction schedule, Miss Allen. I don't think it will, um, but you tell me. No, I think it makes sense. I mean, we've gone through the draft decision ourselves, as I noted earlier. Um, I believe we could probably turn around um, our markup to Attorney Murray tomorrow, I'm hoping. Um, I'm just looking for some feedback from some of the design team to make sure yep. that there are sections particular to their area of interest, the facts are correct, and that um, what we've discussed is correct. Um, so I think if we continue to February, that will give us an opportunity to do a couple things. One, we should have ConCom buttoned up by the end of January. So right. we would have final site plans um, by that point. So that, that would be the final product for you to be reviewing. Um, and then we could um, discuss the conditions. I would, uh, Mr. Wachilla. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was going to ask, um, there was another topic that I don't know if you wanted to save for conditions or to get more clarity on. There was a lot of confusion around local preference and how it's applied. I don't know if you want to get into that tonight or if you want to wait until the next meeting to discuss that further. Um, 
I figured, yeah, I, I figured I'd bring that up. I, I, the um, memo we just we just got it. I mean, and I think that people need to take a look at it. We know that that's going to be a an issue we have to discuss. I think you have a you, um, Miss Allen, you provided something today or yesterday to us, and and I think people should. And I don't know if everybody has has seen it, quite frankly. So I don't know that it makes a lot of sense to spend time on local preference tonight. Um, the one thing I would add, I, so I, I would not spend time on local preference tonight. I would talk, um, have it in the next condition, in the next meeting we have, we'd spend time. You know we're gonna be spending time on that. The other thing that would be helpful, I think, is a, um, a clarification about transfer of the 100% um, of median income homes to transfer to family members and what is done and, and how it can be transferred to family member, how the family member that obtains the transfer, so the second owner, the family member, how they can dispose of that property. I thought I read that the trip, okay, so you got a original owner, the original owner transfers it to the, uh, the son or daughter or another family member, the son or daughter of that other family member within the first 15 years decides they want to sell it. Do they have, are they, does it have to be sold to an income qualified buyer or does it, or is it open to anyone? I know after 15 years, it's open to anyone. Mm -hmm. So that's I the qu believe, yep, clarification that, on that. Yep. And the second clarification is, is this even, is that something that we can even affect or is this Commonwealth builders regulations or is this state regulations about the transferring of this property? So those two things I think are um, issues that we need clarification on. And if you so can get I, that I, done. I can answer those right now if that would be helpful. Okay. So, the, so yeah. the transfer to the family members is the Commonwealth Builders provision. Again, that really is to um, looking to address the racial wealth mm -hmm. um, gap and to uh, ensure that people who have assets are able to pass them down to the next generation. So really that is that is a key provision for Commonwealth builders and I think a very non-negotiable with them. So, so, so that key provision is the, the second owner can transfer it within the 15 years, the second owner can transfer it to anybody. I think it, it I think it applies. I can go back and look at the deeds. I'm pretty sure it applies during any time during the deed, year one through 30. It depend, you know, it doesn't matter if it's one through 15 or 15 through or 16 through 30. At any time, they can transfer to an immediate um, homeowner. I mean, immediate family member. Right. So yeah. I don't know what the exact process is. And I can certainly get clarification from Mass Housing. I'm, I, I doubt because this program is so new. I'm sure they haven't gone through that process yet. So they may not have developed their systems in place. Um, but it, my sense is it wouldn't be much different from somebody who had a market rate unit being able to transfer it. It just probably has some more level of eyes on it through mass housing to confirm family members. So um, I think there's some questions there that we can certainly ask, but like I said, I don't think they've gone through the process yet since this program is so new. Yeah, I don't have any questions about transferring to the family member. I'm okay. Worried. I, I just, my question with transferring that family member selling it within the, what, what can they do? And what you're saying is you think that family, the secondary, that second family member can sell it to anybody at any time, no matter okay. if they're, no, I think what it is, is that the deed restriction still holds year one through 15. So it's transferred to a family member that the provisions of that deed restriction run with that property. Right. Um, I guess the question that I have is whether the town can can do the right of first refusal when it's to an immediate family member. I don't think that is the case, but yeah, I, I, yeah. I, attorney Murray I, I don't think that's shaking a, your head. <laughs> I don't think that's the case. I don't think that's the case either. Um, but yeah, so they would still need to sell it to a um, to a restricted buyer in that first. If, in that first, for the 100 percent in that first fifteen years. Correct. Or they wait for the sixteenth year and sell it to anybody. Correct. Correct. Okay. Got it. And those are Commonwealth Builder regs. Not not that's not a. It's no, not it's a the, provision that you do, or it's not something that we can affect. No, it is Commonwealth Builders. Right. It really yeah. is a key key part of their program. Right. Okay. Yep. Mr. Henry. And, and when you say sell to anyone in year 16, you mean anyone who would qualify under the low income provision? 
for this development. No. No. So that's part of again, it's it's allowing a, a home buyer to gain greater greater equity than they typically would in other projects. You know, if you have a 99 year restriction, you're limited on those on those buyers and what you can you can make for a profit. So the difference between the 16 to 30 is it's that shared equity provision, which means that there is a calculation of how much profit can be made. Um or the, the profit is set at the market, but it's split 50-50 between the home buyer and the public funders. So the town of Amherst would get the money, a portion of that profit of that sale during year 16 to 30. So they can sell in fair open market value. Correct. But, that's but, half, just for, but half of the profit goes back to the town. But okay. that's just for the 100%. Correct. For the yep. 80%. Buyers at eighty percent of median income, it remains. It has to be. It can transfer to a family member all the mm -hmm. time. Yep. But a sale to a non-family member for the thirty years is restricted on income basis. Correct. Correct. And yep. after thirty Correct. years, then you have okay. It Correct. was just a complicated. It's a complicated. It's system. super complicated, and, and we were really trying to negotiate with Commonwealth Builders to allow that one to 15 and 16 to 30 for all of the units to make it equitable for the yeah. development. But because this is a 40B permit, those 80% have to be restricted under the 40B regs. And so they're going to have that universal deed rider, which we provided you with a copy of. So, right. Yeah. Yeah. Is it clear, Mr. Henry? Did that answer your question? It did. Thank you. Great. I know I, I spent a long time trying to figure this out and reading through the deed and then talking with staff to see how I can understand it. Ms. Greenbaum. Yeah. Yes, I have two more complicated things and I hope I can <coughs> speak it out so everybody understands it. Um, I read Ms. Allen's most recent memo about the impact of adopting or how the units will be allocated if we had used the local preference. And so what I'm asking is if she could give us a parallel listing to what would be the impact on tenants or owner selection if we did not have the local preference adopted. In other words, we've got half of it if we have local preference, but we don't have the other half, um, what happens? If, oh, it's kind of mixed up again. We know what happens with local preference, but we don't know what the process of owner selection is without local preference. Did I say it right? I wrote it to Rob in an email, so he, and that, that would be a lot clearer. Does anybody? I, yeah. I did respond. I did respond to this uh, question earlier today, and um, and and Rob does have that, so he can either send out my email response to the board as an attachment in the next board packet, um, and I'm happy to talk through it at a, at it when you want to discuss local preference. Okay, because because I, I you you made it a lot clearer what the process is the tenant selection than at the last meeting that we had. So now I want the parallel scenario for no local conference. Okay, do you, do you get it? Yeah. Okay, and the other issue is what I don't quite understand. You made a statement at one point that the ownership monthly expenses can't exceed 30% of their income. Is that what you said? Correct. So I'm curious about local taxation on the situation of a leasehold, for I gather from the assessor, land is not taxed under a leasehold. It somehow or other comes under the homeowners, but how, when people have different incomes, how are you gonna assess each property that's the same? Presumably the all of the two bedrooms are, are similar and all of the three bedrooms are similar, but some people are locked into a different 
Well, with the 30% of your income, everybody's going to have a different number. So um, how's it going to work? I was in Associa for six years, so that, that's come <laughs> to my mind. And we did have a leasehold arrangement on an ice, ice pond woods up until the 90s, when for some reason the Associa decided to divide it up into lots because of problems with it. So I, I'm curious, because this is another cost to the taxpayer of the town of Amherst. Um, if some people's taxes are lower than others and they're not equitable because of different income, because that doesn't work for anybody else. Yet your taxes, no. whatever your taxes, whatever your so, income, when you so have to be I, I, yeah. Maybe I can restate it. What you're saying is what's, no matter if it's for taxes or for whatever purpose or the homeowners association dues or for, um, because the, all these are factored into the total housing cost. You have the, the mortgage, you have the taxes, and you have the homeowners association. Those are all factored in. What happens when somebody's income drops and it's um, and they can't and they can't meet they their expenses that they that they're obligated for are less than they are there are more than they have more than thirty percent. What do you do? It's not just taxes; it's for anything. And that's a legitimate question I hadn't thought of. I, what happens in that case? So the so if I'm understanding correctly, so the question is if what if somebody's income drops and the taxes increase? Well, well, if, or... so what if their what if their in, what if their income drops? Mm -hmm. Everything their mortgage payment, their condo payment, or the homeowners association and taxes are all factored in, and they all have to be less than it can not exceed thirty percent, right? Yes, and that is to set the initial sales price. So that's how we set, so that's how Mass oh. Housing sets the initial sales prices at the time of marketing. So what they look at at the time is you're looking at the oh. mortgage interest rates. You're looking at um, they're going to look at what we believe the condo fees are going to be. They'll yeah. probably contact the town to determine what the estimated taxes are going to be. Um, so then that's how they figure out what the what they what the homes can be sold for based on all of those sure. factors looking at somebody's income under the hud guidelines and determining that they can't pay more than 30 percent of what their income is based on the guideline does that make sense right so if so if somebody's income drops it's almost they're a homeowner right so right. they either have to go and get uh, um you know go to the make an appeal either to the assessors i mean i think there's a whole this is what happens when you become a homeowner right so, so, so the 30% doesn't go through, it, it's just for qualification it's not it's like section 8 it's not like section 8 where it Correct. And we're not going to kick right? and we're not okay. going to kick anybody out because they're making more than that. You know, then all of a right. sudden they're, they've got yeah. a better job and now they're making more. You're not going to kick somebody out of a property for that. So it's really that that calculation is really to set those sale prices. OK, so it doesn't follow through each. That's not my on an annual basis. All OK, right. so that's my first question related to the taxes, then. Everybody, you're you're setting the sale price for a specific unit for a specific applicant, correct? Not for a specific applicant. So this is at the time of marketing. So when we go to market the homes, when we're probably halfway through construction, we'll get final sale prices with mass housing. They're going to look at all of these different factors. We don't know what the interest rates are going to be two years from now. They could be 3%. They could be 13%. We don't know. Um, and so... They look at all of these different factors at that time. And at that point, they will set sale prices for each of the tiers of homes. So they'll set it for a sales price for the um, for the two bedroom, one story houses, 80% AMI. They'll set a sales price for the one and a half story, two bedroom, 80% AMI. They'll set a sale, a different sales price for the three bedroom, 80% AMI, and they will do the same thing for the 100% AMI. So we will have six different sale prices, and that is what's going to be marketed. We publish that in the newspaper. That's mm -hmm. what gets put out there in terms of this is the sales prices for these homes, and that is set in stone at the time of marketing. Okay, so individual people will not be subsidized for a lower sales cost because their income is less. Everybody pays the same. You pay the same based on what? whatever 
I mean, right. what, no what unit you're purchasing. Correct. No, no deviation from the list of sales. And what they're paying per month is going to depend on a lot of different factors, right? If they've set aside $75,000 for a, a, um, a down payment, that's going to bring their mortgage payment down a lot. If somebody only can put down $6,000, that makes a huge difference. So at the end of the day, it really is going to be very individualized based on some of those factors on how much somebody can put down for down payment. And under Commonwealth Builders, they're required at a minimum to put down 3%. What we model with Commonwealth Builders is a 5% down payment assistance. But somebody could certainly have been saving and squirreling away money um, and able to, or, you know, and able to use those funds. So- yeah. They could put down more. Okay, that was very confusing to me. How, how this was all going to happen. Mr. Henry. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I know we're talking about local preference in our next meeting, but I had a quick question, which was a follow-up from our last sure. meeting. Do we know what number of units would be allocated just for local preference? Not the criteria, just the actual raw number. So it depends on what percentage the community would want to set the, the highest. I'm sorry, people keep jumping around on my screen. Um, so uh, the <laughs> highest that that um, you could be set is 70%, which would be 21 units. Okay. That would be the highest. But I think it's important to read the memo and really understand how it works because it's not typical like a rental project with pooling. It's a tiered system. So once we get through all of the applicants in the first tier, if all 21 homes, if you include local preference and all 21 homes are set, we moved on to second tier. If say you only have 10 people that qualify under tier one and you don't hit your 21, those units tier are, one. they get go down into tier two. And that is outside the local, that is outside your local preference threshold. So the 21 really only would apply to that first tier if this was something you were going to adopt. It's and it's a cap, not a not a minimum. It's a cap, not a minimum. That's a great way of explaining it. Thank you. I read that. Thank you. I read the, I read the tier in part. Thank you. Yep. Um, Ms. Brestra, you had your hand up and yeah, I wanted to say two things. One, in response to Ms. Greenbaum's questions, that um, Kim Mew, who is the assessor, and I think Rob Wachilla probably mentioned this, um, but Kim Mew is willing to come and meet with you to answer questions about taxation. And I think that was one of the things that Ms. Greenbaum was concerned about, that people who um, pay less for their unit have you know less taxes, and so she could go into that if that is of interest. The other thing I wanted to point out is that Laura Baker, who is a representative of Valley Community Development, is in the audience and she has had her hand up for a while. Oh. So she may have some ability to enlighten us about some of these questions. Thank you. That's a, that's a good catch. Um, Rob, can you see bring her in and see if she has to, wants to have a She will be comment. joining shortly. Ms. Baker, can you give us your name and address for the record? Of course. Uh, this is Laura Baker. I work at Valley CDC. We're located at 256 Pleasant Street in Northampton. Um, I did want to jump in and address the question about assessed value because it comes up pretty much every time we develop affordable housing. So um, the assessors will take into account the fact of the deed restriction when they assess the value of these condominiums. So the value is compromised. It is reduced by the fact that the sellers cannot sell it at true market value. And so they have, in fact, I believe now the state has a special code for affordable housing for setting assessed values for affordable um, properties that they didn't used to have. Um, so it it is a fixed tax rate. It doesn't vary based on the income of the owner of the condominium. But it is a, a lower tax rate that reflects the kind of compromised market value of these properties because they are deed restricted. That's all I wanted to add. That makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Well, we're getting to eight o'clock, which is, uh, if we're not going to have additional discussion about conditions, I think that's, we've done enough for tonight. Um, and what I would like to do oh. is move to con 
continue this hearing until a date certain, but I see Ms. Greenbaum, you have your hand up before we move to that. Oh, yes. yes. Oh, yes. I'm the pain in that tonight. Um, I have a question. Looking at with or without, with or without the local subsidy, if somebody makes tier one on all of the other categories and lives in Amherst, a BIPOC person with enough income for a three-family house and works at UMass, for example, and that qualifies under all those other categories, does she also have to, or she, he, the family, count against the local preference or not? In other words, you have a, with the 75% apply or not apply to people who qualified under all the requirements for tier one. And they happen to be a UMass working couple, family. Or can we get can in, say they qualify or all under these things? They don't qualify under the local family, leaving a space for another local family, even though they are. So the way that this <laughs> is set up, the way that this is set up is that the highest priority in terms of the lottery is making sure that we have an appropriate sized household, which is defined right. as a family that is the number of bedrooms plus one. That's of the most importance. Second most important is the DIH qualification, which means living in a qualified census tract. If somebody lives in an Amherst qualified census tract, they've already met that requirement. That's what I mean. Uh, yep. But and does the, add fact local they, the fact that they work at UMass counts against the yeah, it would count against, it would count anybody who lives in the qualified census tract. Yes, they meet it by D, DIH, but then it would also count against local preference. It right. would. So yes. that that is the cap. Then that's what I wanted to know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. So Rob, um, is it February 8th, the next? So uh, Mr. Chair. When so, is the next meeting date that we have for this? Like the, so normally scheduled meeting date or just like a, a 40B meeting date? Well, let's do a 40B meeting date because we've been okay. <laughs> And So when do you, when do you return from uh, your trip, Steve? I I return on the 28th of January. All right. So the options we have for the time being are February 1st or February 15th. Um, or you could also do February 29th, but that's a leap year day. So I don't know if that's a good idea. Um, so either the 1st or the 15th would, would be the most. Um, first is really that's the that's a Thursday. Yep, it is a Thursday. I'm just looking at my calendar here to see what. Yeah, it's a Thursday. Well, um, that gives three weeks for all this work to get done. Is that sufficient from the staff standpoint? Or should we go to the, go out two more weeks? For my schedule, from the, from, if we can do the 15, that would be ideal. Be ideal for me too. But, you know, I, I want to keep this moving along. Um, but <laughs> I think it's also important that we have time to look at everything. And it's a better time for me. The 15th is better. And plus, you'll give ConCom time to, to yeah. approve the permit and stuff and then All do right. your work conditions. So okay. I think that probably makes the most sense. Let's do the 15th at six o'clock. Okay. okay, so I would entertain a motion that we continue this hearing until February 15th at six o'clock. Oh, Ms. Breastman, you public comment. I've forgotten. Oh, no, you're muted. 
Should we do public comments first? Public comments. Yes, we have to do public yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> thank you. I was so anxious. I appreciate both you finding that, um, reminding me of that. All right, now the time for public comment on this. If you wish to comment, uh, please so indicate by raising your hand or by pressing star nine on your phone, star nine, or palm nine, star nine on your phone. And when you do, please give us your name and address for the record. I uh, see no, I see no, sign, no, no hands. I see any hands. Um, I think a lot of the people in attendance are Valley CDC yep. people. And it's the still a good catch, even though there's nobody there. It's really, I appreciate the catch on public comment. Thank you. Yep. All right. Um, any other qu comments from members of the board or from the, the petitioner? Now, now I'll entertain a motion that we continue this until February 15th at 6. So move, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Second. Second. It's been moved and seconded. Any discussion? No discussion. Uh, this requires a roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Oh, <laughs> from the bed, from the sick bed. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. The vote is four to nothing. The motion passed. Uh, the next order of business is public comment on any items not before the board tonight. I see no hands or no phone calls. All right. Nope. Um, the next is just any old, any new business. Normally that's for scheduling, Rob. If you'll just go through the schedule for the next few meetings, that'd be helpful. Sure. Let me pull up my calendar. Um, okay, so next week, January 11th, is our next normally scheduled meeting. Um, that is the continued hearing date for the Shootsbury Road Solar Project, um, as well as a couple of public meeting items that are um, very minor things. Um, the week after that, January 17th, is the continued hearing date for um, the proposed nightclub known as Gabe's Underground at um, Boltwood Walk in the overhang where the uh, former uh, Hazel's Blue Lagoon was located. Um, and then the week after that, we have January 25th. Um, we do have one permit hearing scheduled for that date, but it's escaping me at the moment, Mr. Chair. I apologize. I don't remember what it was. Um, then we have uh, February 8th meeting, uh, we are anticipating a possible variance application to come mm. before the board. Um, and then after that, nothing else is scheduled at the moment with the exception of this on February 15th. Um, that's all I had. Okay. All righty. So, and as always, if you have, um, travel plans or conflicts for meetings, especially for, for full members, please let Rob know so that we can schedule as full a panel as possible. Any other questions from members of the board? All right, it's time to, I think we can close it up. Do we have a motion to, uh, to adjourn? So, so, so. <clears throat> I, I, and I'll take yours as a second, Ms. Greenbaum. So we have, a, it's been moved and seconded. Uh, that motion is not debatable. The vote occurs on the motion to adjourn. Chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Greenbaum? Aye. The vote is four to nothing. Uh, we are adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>